the kind of new pieces there there are some old pieces um that i've been i took it out and um have a few commissions i'm working on so i get to play you know <laughs> in between <laughs> and that's such, like that's such an important thing the play yeah, yeah absolutely I, it's um i think art is play I, ultimately you know so yeah. so that we get we get to do that um but the, the, even you know even that sounds like an excuse when it, it really is main part of what it makes us human is uh you know we need to recover that sense of play so mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah and it, it's part of what makes art a gift mm -hmm. yeah and and not uh, a commodity right 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 exactly we um we talked a lot about how art is most free when it is not commoditized even though you know we understand that that happens in a transaction transactional way um <clears throat> but you know you you do do something when you when that's the only thing that that uh um that we think about um and we we do as part of that playfulness i think i think that also um is something that i was hoping we could talk about today and that's the importance of community mm. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Because we can play by ourselves, but when we're young, we play in community and we learn through that. Mm -hmm. And we fight and. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it provides this constructive framework. Yeah. Yeah. Um, without much intervention, right. We, uh, we play the best when there's freedom and, and, and trust, I suppose, of boundaries uh, created in friendship. But um, yeah, we need community to be 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 able to bring bring out the best in ourselves. You recently shared a part of a talk that you gave mm -hmm. for the Red Vineyard Group in Nashville, yeah. and I, as I listened to it, I thought about he's giving this to a community. Yes, to yeah. people that are choosing to be in conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think back over your own history and the group you were part of at Redeemer in the early 2000s mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how that was so formative yeah. mm -hmm. and sustaining. Mm -hmm. And I I wonder how you would speak to that. Oh, my goodness. I was just thinking about this, JD. I, I just saw Joyce D, um, who was my first assistant assistant uh, after 9-11. Um, she was the first person I hired and and she had just made a decision to pursue being an artist um, rather than being in marketing and branding and uh, so forth. And um, then she became the, the first hire at Culture Care Organization, uh, which is now I am Culture Care, and uh, you serve on the board with us. And um, it's it's such a journey of gratitude because I get to see over the years how people have matured in their art and matured in their leadership, and 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 when when we got together. You know, we, we got to reminisce about some of that, um, but also uh, be grateful that this community that developed, especially after 9-11, I, I, I think was very significant. It was a small group of people gathering, but we insisted on meeting in Ground Zero Cafe, Robert De Niro's Cafe there um, for many, many years. And I think that led to many, many things, you know, not not just productive things like collaborations and so forth, but but friendships and and also a sense of belonging when um, it, it felt like everything was um, dissolving you know, or you know disappearing. And um, so 
I think of these, um, you know, ad hoc <laughs> gatherings that um, often will pop up out of creative interests or, um, you know, in, in some cases it's intentional like theater, you know, it's, it's you, 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 you have to be together on stage and, and, and so forth. But um, there's, there's something very deeply um, um, needed, you know, about, about that. As visual artists, we, we work alone in, in the studio and, um, and yet, you know, these conversations, uh, even over Zoom and uh, talking about our works and even looking at the studio in the background, you know, and and it's, it's a kind of communing that we get to do through art. And, um, and there's something very special about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I've known you to be a person that cultivates community wherever you are. Yeah. Um, I think about the fellows group that you cultivated at Fuller and at Bucknell yeah. and um, you're always gathering people into conversations, right? And I, I wonder how you would frame that as mm -hmm. um, a mechanism of culture care. Yeah. You know, what's funny about that, Julia, is that initially I really didn't think I can do that uh, because I'm a very high introvert and I crave being alone in a studio. <laughs> Yeah. And why, why would I invite anybody else, you know, in the process or even, even having interns, right? Um, and then having people like yourself and others, I, I realized that, you know, there, there was this even um, not just a need for it, but 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 a desire for it. And uh, I, I think over the years, I it was through the community uh, that, made me realize that I needed <laughs> that community. <laughs> and, and otherwise I, I wouldn't have thought to even, you know, desire some uh, being intentional about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And and so I think looking back, it was uh, unexpected, um, you know, gift mm -hmm. that I, I, I feel like I received over the years and, and, whenever there's a sense of belonging or uh, even beholding uh, something together, you know, there's, there's something very profound about that. And I, I have been thinking about my own journey as an artist. And of course, the community part was separate from what I do in the studio. But, you know, in some ways, I'm increasing thinking that it's it's not at all separate, you know, that it's it's all connected and and we're attuned that way to even our own way of thinking about our, our imagination and creativity um, through conversations, right? even even through trying to encourage somebody or uh, mentoring somebody, you know, it, it's, it's always two ways. And um, I, I often feel like I get more out of <laughs> that than, than the person receiving it. But um, it, it really is a change in how I view my own art that, that, you know, I, I have become more aware that, that what I do in the studio all alone is is connected um, with people, with community, yes, but with nature as well. You know, that's another communion is we we have this connection with the materials, um, with the ecosystem in Nihonga, these paper makers and, you know, people who grind pigments for me and prepare them. Um, and and that, that ecosystem, is is something that I always felt aware that you know it was important, but but I I don't know if I ever thought of it as art. You know that that's a part of my art is 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 these um, conversations and relationships and and the, what I do 
in painting is is a portal of, of sorts to invite others you know in this theater of life let's say there's, there's a backdrop you know <laughs> and and we're in front of it uh just like you are in front of your paintings and and the, there's something very mysterious about that and powerful mm. yeah mm. our our community our relationships they're part of our ecological estuary that's yeah. promoting that's feeding our work that's sending it farther downstream yeah exactly and and when we exhibit um you know some of that opens up and and in unexpected ways right we we we're not um in in some ways ready for how people respond to our work so we're not in control of that but um that that opens a door for total strangers <laughs> to walk in and and I think Rothko was very, you know, very sharp when he talked about how his own paintings are um, talking to each other, first of all. And then when the audience comes in, um, it's it's their response that makes the paintings come alive in a sense, you know, and, and it's so easy to forget that when you're talking about or teaching art that you know mm -hmm. this is a way to invite people you know not just self-expression mm -hmm. you know and as any kind of friendship or community would do you you know share um perhaps interesting and important things but it's in in the presence of that person um that is activating something new you know in, in into my own paintings you know mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah as i watched your talk for the red renewed yeah. group yeah. i kept thinking about the simone Weil quote that yeah. attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity yeah yeah and i think that that encapsulates mm. what we're talking about in this community element as well yeah and she also said that the uh, 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 mixed attention is is prayer, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah um, those things are connected. Seems like, yeah. Yeah, attention taken to the highest degree. Yeah, is yeah the same thing as prayer. And and I think we realize that that's also art. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. it's that attentiveness to materials and ourselves and 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 our world and universe. Um, right, we're listening posts and we. We are trying to simply be a vessel to, you know, uh, create a flow into the world. And um, so paying attention to each other, paying attention to what is surrounding us, what's in front of us, what's ahead of us, you know, all, all these things really create a rich environment for ourselves but art is fundamental to that because art is one way that we can learn train our senses to mm -hmm. pay attention mm -hmm. yeah and that's the other thing like this whole we we've so fractured our understanding mm. of self of work of prayer they they're all existing as these separate entities right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and yet The divine is seeking wholeness. Yeah. Yeah. Part of why Sandra and I connected was through this organization called Goldenwood, who is uh, started out as part of um, Redeemer's work and faith. Um, and then it, it, it became its own thing. And the Reverend David Kim started this and, and he, saw this disintegration as you're speaking about uh happening between certainly faith and work but work and life and uh, you know even even how we frame that right faith and work is as if they're two different things and you you know you're trying to put them together integrate them in some way right? and faith and art maybe another way but um but you know much much of it is a discussion about um integration and live, living in presence of 
uh, reality um, and whether that be a workplace or home or you know that there's really no proper way to separate them apart from like artificial categories you know <laughs> of uh, you know maybe we're used to that uh, going to school and coming home and blah 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 but but really all all, all of it is life um and and life ultimately is is to uh, uh at least understand the opportunity to love deeply uh what we do right and who we are as human human beings and so if you love your work then that's a very different set of expectations <laughs> than just nine to five checking in and you know getting your paycheck um this is very similar to how artists view their work <laughs> you know because we we don't feel like we're working it's it's hard work <laughs> but it's not separate from our lives in fact we we see it all connected mm -hmm. and so Sanjay and I are contributing in that sense to help people who you know have day jobs and they they have their engineers and you know doctors and plumbers and so forth um help them how how can we as artists help people to love their their work um but love what they do um and how they go about it um and so this was this video came out of that conversation mm -hmm. and something that i've been working on for the past few years in in my studio practice is that idea of opera divina holy work mm. which mm. continues the benedictine idea of oro et labora work and mm. prayer and mm. makes it one Mm -hmm. right to yeah. work is to pray yes. it's to acknowledge that we are yes. that we do have an omniscient god mm -hmm. an omnipresent god yeah. that is with us at all times if and we can be in communication we can be in prayer mm -hmm. if we tune our attention towards mm -hmm. that in the midst of our action mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's yeah. a somatic experience yeah. of prayer as well but I, I think about that and I, I, I work on that idea a lot. <laughs> I, well, and, I, and I think of my work, my painting, they're offerings. Yes. They're not like they, they are just this thing that I'm putting out there. They're not um, mm. clocking an hour, right? right? And you know what you do, right? Faithfully every day in your studio matters to if if that is prayer mm -hmm. it, it is affecting change you know it's like a butterfly effect where, you know if you don't do it something will not happen you know mm -hmm. i believe that and um when we are faithful to do things that may may be invisible to the world uh we may not even show that work to the world you know but we're doing it as an offering and as as prayer um then I, I really do believe something is happening um, elsewhere, you know, mm -hmm. in this connected ecosystem that, you know, we are part of, part of, uh, part of Goldenwood. We, we've been talking about mushrooms and mycerium network, <laughs> you know, how uh, the trees all talk to each other actually through their roots and these, this, you know, mushrooms are everywhere and actually they are helping to connect uh natural uh realities um in very diverse especially in a diverse ecosystem they kind of help to communicate um at the whole and you know part, part of what we lack is an understanding of how our faith and what we do to create beauty is already connected to the highest places and 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 to the most marginalized places mm -hmm. you know the, the the these are part of the ecosystem that we're you know we're part of so um you know what we do secretly maybe you know without anybody seeing it um it can affect through these networks of 
you know, invisible chains that are all connected. And so, and of course, theologically, you know, this is uh, post-resurrection new creation work is, is the most exciting part of that. That is that it's connected to the other side of creation, which, which is only what God can do, but um, it's somehow our little efforts are being uh, amplified and uh, brought into new solid reality um, that we can only imagine, uh, or maybe we cannot even imagine um, what that might be, but it's affecting the future. Um, and when we are just simply doing what we do, the little that we, <laughs> we do in our studios. Mm -hmm. this is what would be your vision your prayer for a generative future oh my <laughs> i know that that's massive but it's also yeah. yeah well in a sense i'm doing trying to define that every day in my studio right mm -hmm. and and these are of course you can use words to describe the future um but on the other hand you know maybe it is best to leave it to the ecosystem to mm -hmm. articulate you know i do my part and you you can do yours if everybody's doing their their what they're designed to do um the stones will cry out mm -hmm. and say you know maybe we didn't realize that what we are doing uh, actually is creating the future um, in very tangible ways. Mm -hmm. um, we may not understand it for a long time, you know, sometimes uh, centuries later, right? Uh, Emily Dickinson's poems and, you know, box music, you know, they, they all were hidden for a while. And may, maybe that's good too. Um, and we, 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 you know, we're not in control of that. So part of what we can do is to um, definitely be faithful and pay attention. Um, but at the same time, you know, articulating the, the future is, is a holistic practice. You know, it's, it's, it is going, going back to, it. you know, it is uh, paying attention to what we, are doing paying attention to what we were paying attention to and mm -hmm. and and staying with that right and then diving deep and cultivating that and and i wonder in a time of polarization and divisions and wars and you know strife all around the world um maybe we are called in in even deeper to that work of integration um uh, you know, not because we have a particular vision for it, because we're forced to surrender what we think the future can hold. You know, like like the, the there's this imminent danger, um, and so you you cannot do anything but by faith. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, that requires faith uh, ultimately, and so if we it would be very easy to be cynical and anxiety driven, fearful, you know, kind of a knee jerk reaction to what's going on and scream and shout. And, and, but the hardest thing to do is to have hope, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if we are going to do that, then we have to intentionally do that. Um, and, and I, I, I do think art is fundamentally an act of hope because, you know, you're facing your blank page, um, you know, watercolor paper, um, you know, stretch canvas, or, and and if you're in music, you're facing silence, right? And you choose to put something forward in the universe that only you can do. And, and that cannot be done unless you hope that that would resonate somehow. Um, perhaps to yourself, but but also to an audience. Um, and even if it's God who <laughs> is the only one who hears it, um, you know, we, we are acting in hope. Mm -hmm. 
And that connects with that idea of that Christian Wyman coined nice. the bright abyss. Yes, my bright abyss. Yeah, such a beautiful statement. Um, as he suffered through into that place of brightness. Um, and um, I was just li listening to a requiem by James Whitbourne, who is the best friend of my friend, uh, James Jordan. Uh, he, he's a maestro uh, choir director or Westminster choir. And, and James Whitbourne just passed away uh, suddenly. Um, uh, it was very sad, very young and a young composer, but he had composed his requiem before he passed and he couldn't finish it. So John Rutter, the extraordinary composer, finished it for him. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna play this at Carnegie Hall. So I'm actually uh, doing a small piece um, for the family right now, but um, listening to it, this Requiem, right, was written before he found out that he was ill. <laughs> and and yet it, it's pressed forward into this reality of death and brokenness. And then it carries us beyond. <laughs> It, it's a very strange experience listening to it. And I'm sure when it's sang live in, in, in Carnegie Hall, I, I, it's gonna be extraordinary. But I felt there was this unction uh, for me as an artist to hear this and, and to say that, you know, we, we don't know the future, but, uh, but we are creating the future. Right, this requiem exists because James Whitbourne, you know, wanted to write something and something definitive about faith, something about you know hope, and something that says Amen. You know, that's his last uh, last section is uh, Amen music, <laughs> and and it's 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 really. Uh, reminded me um I, I've been thinking about it all day just reflecting on it yeah yeah to to sit in the hope I mean within the liturgical calendar we're in holy week yes we're in a season of expectancy of hope mm -hmm. uh, but also of profound darkness yeah yeah darkest day um, holy Saturday right yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so here we are, living yeah. with hope, presenting right. our offerings. Mm -hmm. And art, in some ways, is all about Holy Saturday, right? It, you know, uh, a friend of mine, Rector, said, uh, you know, you, you can't do anything about Good Friday. That's historically what happened to Jesus dying on the cross. And you really can't do anything about Easter, you know, <laughs> that's God breaking open uh, the chain of death, you know, but you can do a lot about Holy Saturday, you know, which is a day of reflecting and then waiting in anticipation, um, hopefully with faith, right? Um, it can be the darkest day uh, of the year uh, if you don't have that. Um, and we know many people who sit in that darkness without hope. But um, we ourselves, we can create out of that expectation and even even pushing into the darkness and 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 in some ways, you know, describing it well. Um, and and but that is done with hope <laughs> that the resolution of whatever it is that we're struggling with will not be in vain. Um, but everything that we do will, uh, you know, will, will be, um, will become part of this rising, um, choir or music or aroma, you know, feast, uh, that we, we get to be part of, um, and our art, uh, you know, can, can definitely be an offering for that, um, abundant feast to come. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>